Dottie and Doris have been best friends for 64 years after meeting in their high school drama club. Doris is fit for her age. She lives alone and takes her Jack Russell for daily walks, plays bowls at her local team and is partial to a bit of a boogie at the social club down the road. Dottie, however, is quite frail. She had a heart attack five years ago and has been on several medications following this. She doesn't leave the house very often and her only social contact is with Doris, who comes to visit once a week. One evening, the girls are reminiscing about their time in drama class when Doris stumbles backwards and falls hard onto her hip. Dottie rushes out of her chair to help, but in the process trips and falls to land on the floor beside her friend. Unlucky. She sets off her alarm necklace and the ambulance picks the two besties up to take to hospital. In hospital, both receive immediate x-rays before being taken to theatre. Despite their similar injuries, the two old ladies are treated with different surgical procedures. My name's Connor, and in the next five minutes we're going to learn the surgical anatomy of the hip and apply what we've learned to understand what's happened to Doris and Dottie. Welcome to 5 Minute Anatomy. Before we get started, take a second to click the subscribe button. Only a minority of our viewers are subscribed to the channel, but doing so is absolutely the best way to encourage us to keep making videos and teaching anatomy. The hip joint is an articulation between the head of the femur and the acetabulum of the pelvis. Let's take a look at the femur first. The head is round and covered with smooth articular cartilage. It is this that moves against the head of the pelvis in the hip joint. Directly adjoining this is the cylindrical neck of the femur, which projects outward to increase the range of motion of the hip joint without compromising stability. The two key projections of the superior femur are the greater trochanter, which is the site of attachment for many of the hip muscles, and the lesser trochanter, which is similar to the greater trochanter but has less muscular attachments. Joining the greater and lesser trochanters is a bony ridge known as the intertrochanteric line. The last key feature to note is a small section of missing articular cartilage on the head of the femur. This is known as the fovea and is the point of attachment for one of the hip ligaments. Now looking at the pelvic side of the hip joint, we have the acetabulum. This is formed at the convergence of the pubis, ischium and ilium bones that form each hemipelvis. The articular part of the acetabulum is moon-shaped and incomplete, so is known as the lunate surface. Reinforcing the inferior part of the acetabulum is the transverse acetabular ligament. Lastly, the non-articular middle of the acetabulum is known as the acetabular fossa and is not coated by cartilage. There's a small gap in the inferior part of the joint known as the acetabular foramen, which permits the entry of a small branch of the obturator artery. Around the edge of the acetabulum is an outcropping of tissue known as the acetabular labrum, which, like the glenoid labrum in the shoulder joint, acts to deepen the hip joint and increase stability. There are four key ligaments holding the head of the femur into the hip joint. The first is posterior to the joint and goes from the ischium to the greater trochanter, thus it is known as the ischiofemoral ligament. Anteriorly, there's the pubofemoral ligament from the superior pubic rami to the intratrochanteric line, and the iliofemoral ligament from the iliac spine to the intratrochanteric line. The last ligament sits inside the hip joint and joins the fovea of the femur approximately to the acetabular fossa. This is known as the ligament of the head of the femur or sometimes the ligamentum teres. In younger people, a branch of the obturator artery usually runs inside this ligament. Blood supply to the hip comes from a number of arteries arising both from the thigh and the pelvis. Most blood comes from the medial circumflex femoral artery, which is a branch of the deep femoral artery. The deep femoral artery also produces the lateral circumflex femoral artery, which supplies part of the posterior hip. Additional blood supply comes from the obturator artery and the inferior and superior gluteal arteries, which all come from the pelvis. Now it's worth taking a closer look at how these blood vessels reach the head of the femur. Aside from the small obturator branch which runs inside the ligamentum teres, all of the blood reaching the head of the femur comes in a retrograde fashion, meaning it starts distally and turns to travel proximally. This means if the femur is fractured at its neck, the blood supply to the head can easily become compromised. The results of this are known as avascular necrosis, with avascular meaning no blood vessels and necrosis meaning tissue death. The head of the femur can begin to die due to a lack of blood supply to it. Some of you may remember that the scaphoid bone in the hand has a similar blood supply to this and undergoes a similar process when fractured. A person with a fractured neck of femur will have a shortened and externally rotated leg. Now, 
There are three main ways the femur can fracture in this region. These are intracapsular breaks, also sometimes known as subcapital breaks, which occur proximal to the intertrochanteric line and thus inside the joint capsule. The other two types are intertrochanteric breaks between the greater and lesser trochanter and subtrochanteric breaks below the levels of the trochanters. These two are both classified under the subheading of extracapsular fractures. The degree of dissociation of the two parts of the fracture can be defined using the garden classification system. Now finally, let's cover the options available to fix fractures of the neck of femur. For intracapsular fractures, we divide the treatment options depending on whether the two parts have become displaced or not. If the head is not displaced from the rest of the femur, you can use a method of internal fixation that utilises three cannulated screws arranged in a triangular fashion. This holds the two parts in alignment and encourages the bone to heal normally. If the head has become displaced, cannulated hip screws usually won't hold the two parts together adequately. Thus, the surgeon will often opt to replace the head of the femur with a prosthetic part in a procedure known as a hemiarthroplasty. This may also be used if the patient is particularly frail and unlikely to benefit from internal fixation. When the fracture is intertrochanteric, you can use a dynamic hip screw, which allows some sliding of the two parts. The compressive action encourages healing of the bone and generally has good outcomes. Finally, if the fracture is subtrochanteric, a large intramedullary femoral nail may be used to anchor the proximal fragment down into the distal fragment. Of course, if none of these options seem suitable, or if the patient is particularly weak, the surgeon may opt to perform a total hip replacement with a full prosthetic hip. So, returning to our two besties. Both suffered an intracapsular fracture to their neck of femur. However, Dottie received a hemiarthroplasty, whilst Doris was treated with cannulated hip screws. Have a think about why the two were treated differently, despite their similar presentations. When you think you've worked it out, leave your answer in the comments down below. And there we go. That's the surgical anatomy of the hip and hip fractures covered in five minutes. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content like this. I hope you've learned something and have a great day.